Welcome, everybody. So to get us started today, I just want to say welcome to Creative Production Day 2021. Uh, thanks to Henry Stewart Events for bringing us all together today. And thanks to each of you even more for showing up for yourselves and for your brands. I, I believe we're all here because we share the same challenges. We're asked to get more done faster and better with less, more volume, more velocity, personalization. There's the evolution of existing channels and the explosion of new ones and nobody's throwing bodies at me to help. We're asked to do all of this, not only without losing creative integrity, but now with an imperative for authenticity. So if those are your challenges too, you are not alone and you are in some very good company today. You're gonna to see some really smart people who work for great brands and who have the exact same challenges as you. Some may be at different stages of their creative production journey, but the breadth of businesses represented here today really demonstrates the universal nature of the struggle. Hearing aids, financial services, high-end fashion, media and entertainment, skincare, bespoke clothing, behavioral change, as well as consultants and technologies that power creative ops and the freelance workforce. These folks are gonna talk about those challenges. And I hope that makes you feel the community that's here that we're not afraid to share those challenges with, with each other in this setting. But they're also going to be generous and share with the community their approach to solutions. As they talk through these solutions, you'll want to listen for some common themes. And those theme, themes will probably come as no surprise because I'm sure you've heard them before. The triumvirate of people, process, and tools. You'll probably hear that process is always part of the solution conversation. How good process supports brand consistency, yet how flexibility in your process can actually be what allows your brand voice to break through. And how intentionally auditing your processes can grease the skids for volume. And how especially in the absence of unlimited resources, process enables seamless scaling. I suspect you'll also hear that prioritization is the queen to the, the king of process. I hope you'll hear today how we in creative ops and production are in the right place in our businesses to inform decisions about what creative gets produced, how much of it and why. You'll also probably hear reiterated that testing and metrics play a more important role than ever. And that's right in our wheelhouse. The solutions you'll hear about will also call for collaboration and planning across functional borders. You'll hear about the importance of aligning on messaging and briefs up front, about the value of having an ongoing dialogue with your partners, about the give and take between volume, speed, and quality. You'll also hear how closing the loop with those partners on results and ROI can ultimately improve your ability to capacity plan. Tools are also a common thing in the solutions you'll hear about today. A reuse strategy, for instance, supported by DAM can enable personalization at scale. And even simple analog tools like workflow documentation can support faster onboarding of staff and partners and therefore speed to market. And I also strongly suspect you'll hear that the most effective solutions acknowledge the primacy of a consistent and relevant story in actually driving production efficiency. Of course, also listen for how much flexibility is actually needed within all of those solutions. Missing samples, broken supply chains, photographers doubling as their kids' teachers while on set in the garage. The ability to adapt is critical to your ability to execute. COVID wasn't the first interruption and it won't be the last. And last, but certainly not least, the solution to every one of these challenges is ultimately created and implemented by people. So listen for ways others are supporting their people, how they're creating opportunities for those people to participate and be part of the solutions, and also how they make time and stay focused on keeping those people happy and growing. So what do we want for you today? We, we hear a lot of talk about the future of lately, the future of work, the future of retail, the future of the office, automation, AI. 
I don't want to discount any of that. It's important, even critical, to make room for big ideas and innovation. And in fact, there's a session on that here today. But I don't know about you. I still have to figure out how to execute at warp speed right now. So today, we want to try to strike a balance. We want to give you something tangible to take back and implement in the morning. Incremental improvements may not be sexy, but they matter and they add up. And on balance, we want today to provide space and time and, and the opportunity for the future of you and yours to be exposed to new ideas and approaches that might feel like moonshots to you today. We want you to find the balance that's right for you. Listen to the ways others are coping and adapting and even innovating, learn from them. Learn from each other, don't be afraid to ask questions. You'll hear a million good ideas, but you'll need to make your own bespoke playbook, your own list of takeaways. Parse what makes sense for your business and your future business and have the confidence that you know what that is. Be open, be bold and be brave, but don't lose sight of the fact that no one knows your business as well as you. I also want you to appreciate the gift you've given yourself by being here today. Acknowledge that it's hard to make space for learning when doing tends to steal most of the focus, but you did it and you're here. And lastly, I want you to notice that you're not alone. Notice that there's a community here. This community can help you with the what and the how of these solutions. And it's made up of your peers, we get you. The people in this community can act as advisors, sounding boards, even what organizational psychologist Adam Grant calls your challenge network, the people who push you to question and to improve. So be an active participant. Speaking from experience, if you make time to give to this community, it'll give back to you and to your ability to execute for your brand. So thanks to all attendees from across the globe for tuning in today. And thank you to our event sponsor, Seltra, for supporting the event. If you want to find out more about Seltra, chat with a member of their team, or learn how they can support you in automating and scaling your creative production, click on the Learn About Seltra tab inside the platform. We also invite you to post on the Community tab throughout the event, also in the platform. You can ask questions and do polls answer polls. During the sessions, we also encourage you to chat with the community with your fellow attendees and of course, make the most of our expert lineup by submitting your questions using the panel on the right hand side of your screen. If at any point you have uh, need help during the event, there is a chat bot at the bottom right of the screen and this, uh, the Henry Stewart team is available to help you um, through whatever you need help with. Um, and now I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for today, Heidi Henneman, who will talk to us about navigating the creative sandbox. Heidi is the director of Mark, executive director of marketing and creative operations at Drunk Elephant Skincare. Heidi's specialty is helping small brands grow into global powerhouses through creative processes, global consistency, and symbiotic teamwork. Heidi honed her skills over a 15 year tenure at the Estee Lauder companies, working on such top tier brands as Joe Malone London, Mac Cosmetics, La Mer, Prescriptives, and many others. So welcome Heidi, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you, Amy. Hi everyone, hope you're having a great day. So full disclosure, I am the mom of a toddler and that toddler is about two and a half right now. About a year ago, I was sitting right here um, in this chair at this computer on a Zoom call with my colleagues and having a chat and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a little boy climb that bookshelf right there, right behind me. And of course, we just started COVID, you know, remote working and um, I thought I had it all together. I was like, okay, you know, what's happening here? I'm all of a sudden I realized I did not have control of the situation. And I'm sure that you guys have been in that situation too, where not maybe with a toddler climbing a bookshelf, but all of a sudden you realize, oh no, I do not have this. I am not in control. But as creative services professionals, as project managers, as producers, it's our job 
to be in control of everything, right? Of timelines, of budgets, of the final product, typically of our creative teammates. Um, but keeping, you know, creative minds on time, on budget, and on task is really challenging. What if instead of trying to control everything, including our creative teammates, what if we learned how to better navigate the creative sandbox together so that we can be less stressed, more collaborative, and have a lot more fun with our jobs? So let's talk about that today. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. So my first rule, don't be, oh, sorry. <laughs> don't be a bulldozer. Don't be a bulldozer. Okay. So at the beginning of my career, when I was starting out with the Estee Lauder Corporation, I um, was producing photo shoots and I was producing ad campaigns and I was working for um, the prescriptives team um, under the Estee Lauder brand. And prescriptives has kind of gone away. We may have some online presence now, but uh, not a lot. But at the time it was a big brand and it was up to me to manage the photo shoot. And I managed it to a T. I had you know, with the timelines down, I had the product there, I had the models all signed, the stylist, the wardrobe, um, I had everything planned down to the minute, run a show to the minute, um, you know, when they could have their coffee, when they had to come out of hair and makeup, when they had to come out of wardrobe, when the first shoot, the first picture had to be done, and how many images we had to capture that day. And y'all, I thought I did an amazing job. Like we were buttoned up. Everything was click, 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 click. Honestly, I had a stopwatch and I'm gonna say I might've had a whistle, but you know, history, you know, is, is a little fuzzy on that. And I thought we did a great job, as I said, um, but here's what I found out. A few weeks after that photo shoot, I sat down with my art director and my creative director who I absolutely loved. I just thought they hung the moon. And I was so excited to have a, you know, a recap about this photo shoot and you know, how it went. And I thought we were gonna get lots of bubbly praise, right? So I came in with that attitude and um, they sat me down and we had a little lunch and we talked through it. And uh, they said to me, so Heidi, we gotta talk about this. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, what, what happened? What's going on? And they said, so we gotta let you know, you have a nickname. And I was like, oh God, I have a nickname? Like, what's this? What's this? And their tone was a little off and I was like, oh. And they said, people call you Heidi the Hammer. And you know, that was not fun. That was a little bit of a gut punch. And not only was it not fun to hear that, what I found out in that conversation was that that photo shoot might've been fun for me, but it was not fun for anyone else. Everyone else felt like they were not given the breadth of space to get the creative inspiration that they wanted. And while we did produce you know, beautiful visuals, they weren't inspired to the level that that creative team was hoping they would be. And so it took me a minute to you know, really think about you know, what had happened there and what I could have done differently. And it turns out it's just a matter of being in the creative sandbox with the creative team instead of you know, having your own agenda and the, setting the parameters for everyone else. So going forward, you know, I really worked on that. And one thing I realized was, hey, we're on the same team. We're going for the same goal. We want the same thing to happen, right? We want the best product. We want the best visuals, the best campaign, the best messaging. That's what we're all striving for as a brand, as for a campaign, what, you know, however big your company is, you're all striving for that, you know, wonderfully inspired campaign that's just going to click with the consumer, click internally, whoever your audience is. So you're on the same team, we're working to the same goal. Um, and also your teammates have value. You have value as the, you know, producer or the project manager and your timelines and your processes, those are so important. But the creative teams, you know, thought processes are also so 
incredibly important. So it's really, imp it's really, you know, integral to allow your creative team the time and the breath to think through, you know, what they want to do and what is going to inspire them to bring the best product to life. The next thing I want to talk about is, you know, think outside of the sandbox. So we all know that, you know, we think a certain way as, you know, producers, we're like linear. We got this to that, to that, to that, to get us where we need to go. But when you're dealing with a creative team, you know, they think more ethereally. Their, their inspiration comes from so many different places. And it's really important that we foster that and we support that and not just A to B to C to D, but A to maybe Z and come back to C. That's, you know, that's going to happen in the creative process. And the ways you can support that in your timelines and in your production and your, your, you know, execution, there are several ways to do that. So one is to collaborate with a team, really understand what they're trying to, um, you know, get to, like, what is their vision? and support that vision. So let me give you, for instance, I work at Drunk Elephant. We are a very visual, colorful brand. Our vision merchandising is, you know, acrylics and, you know, neons and all these crazy colors. And when we go into a retailer space for visual merchandising, you know, retailers are like, we want a glorifier. You have a space for a light box. Here's a poster. You can put your pricing signage. And we said, you know what, that's actually not gonna work for us. So we really worked with the retailers to come up with a solution in the first market, which was North America, to really create that disruptive space. And I worked with a creative team to you know, figure out materials, like what does that cost? How can we work to bring that together to create and implement the vision that they're in trying to achieve? Even if that vision was kind of outside of the parameters of what was asked. You know, we were asked for a glorifier and a, like I said, a you know, basic visual merchandising for a product. And we said, no, we want something else. So you support your team in the production. You support your team by um, thinking of solutions and coming with solutions to the team of, you know, in that, in that instance for visual merchandising, we did the North America rollout. And then we just became this huge brand in the last couple of years. And we've launched into Sephora EU, had the same issue. But what we realized was that, you know, market wasn't, hadn't yet understood what we wanted. And for us to execute what we wanted, we had to also look at every possible solution. And in this case, instead of handing our work over to a market for them to produce locally, because they thought it was going to be cheaper, timing was going to be better, you know, they wanted to be in control of it. We took that back and said, you know what? We're going to figure out a way to produce this and get it to you. And we'll use suppliers that you have locally, but we're going to figure out a way that we can have the global consistency that we need, the materials that we need, that acrylic and all those fancy materials that just maybe weren't available in that market. And that that particular local vendor who was used to print production or, you know, cardboard production just didn't have the capability to do. We looked at the side of the box and we redeveloped that procurement and, uh, you know, uh, production process for that visual merchandising to be shipped into that market. And now we've been taken, you know, we've been under the Shiseido umbrella for now about a year. We are now our process that we created is now not just a process for Drunk Elephant. It's now becoming one of the Shiseido brand pillars of of best in practice. So we've taken something, taken a, a solution that was a, you know, a creative, like how are we gonna make this creative vision happen? And now it's become, you know, a company-wide execution plan. So again, thinking outside of the box, really listening to what your creative team is, is envisioning and trying to bring to market and seeing if there's a way around the rules, thinking outside the sandbox to get there. And I have a couple of little tricks also. Um, when you're talking about process and building your timelines, we're all building timelines and processes. We're all tweaking that, you know, every day for every program. Think about ensuring that not only the production piece of it is, you know, clear, because you're going to know that piece. You're going to know how long it takes to print something. You're going to know how long it takes to, you know, produce uh, a light box, produce uh, packaging. You know that piece of it. 
And then you know the piece that's kind of the in, you know, internal like approval process. We're gonna be a little bit there. So you build that and then you take this section here that is the creative process and you try to give as much time there as you can. And here's a really easy trick. We need seven weeks, seven days or seven seven minutes. So when you get a project in, it could be, you know, a quick editing project, a quick, um, you know, repackaging of artwork project, your logo, place them in and edit, you know, typo edit. That's a seven minute project. It takes that long. You know, we don't really need a timeline for that. We just give it to the team and they go for it. Seven days are those, you know, programs that are, um, you know, no, you know, small pieces of printing pieces, um, croppings for light boxes, um, you know, packaging uh, updates for your ILNs and things that you need for that, digital updates, you know, digital designs of emails. Those are seven day programs and you can build that timing out. And then when you look at the longer term projects, your big campaigns, your, um, your photo shoots, you know, those types of things, your visual merchandising campaigns, really think about that as the seven week plan and try to, whenever you can, give seven weeks to your, um, your team. And I will tell you, I'm gonna give a shout out. I learned the seven, seven, seven plan from a guy named Dave Henry, who I worked with at um, Joe Malone, uh, many, many months ago. And, you know, he, it just changed the way I thought about things like putting things in different, um, you know, uh, pockets for creative allows them the, the breadth of space to really think through things and prioritize. So think about 777. Seven, seven. Again, it doesn't apply to everything, but it does give you that idea of, okay, I know the priority is small, the priority is meaning this is a big, and we've got to focus on that. And then when you're building your creative timelines, also follow the 80-20 rule. And this is one I repeat to my team quite a bit, 80-20. Plan out 80% of everything you're doing. Get it down to the minute. Get, you know, all those things in there. And then allow 20% of whatever you're doing to be flexible. Because you want to be able to adapt to those last minute changes, those inspired moments where you the team looks at it at the end and like, oh, wait a second let's do something completely different. And you wanna be able to do that. So build your timeline so that you've got 80% down. Again, those first sections of that timeline from the end to the beginning, when you build those out, you know exactly where production is, maybe it's translations, maybe it's reviews. And then this section, just give it a little extra space for creative so that they have that breadth of space. And then you can ensure that you're um, giving them the time and the uh, and, uh, time and, and research time or you know um, thinking time that they need to execute that to the best way possible. My next tip for you, know when to call in the big trucks. So let's say you've built everything out and you're kind of working through all of that. That's amazing. Um, what I'd like you to think about is when do you call in the big trucks? You call in the big trucks for three reasons. You call in the big trucks for, I'm gonna close my share here. You call in the, you call in the big trucks for three reasons. You call in the big trucks when you wanna communicate. So first of all, if you're not doing a hot list on Mondays, do a hot list. Let people know what's coming up. Just put it in writing and copy, you know, a, a level above you so that everyone has visibility so that people aren't chasing each other. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Manage, but don't micromanage. So again, you're going to communicate, but you're not going to be a bulldozer. You're not going to nag them every minute. You're going to find out where they are in a process and act accordingly, and you're not going to follow up every two seconds. But when you communicate, then everyone sees what's happening. Your bosses see what's happening. You see what's happening. Their bosses see what's happening. And the team all can, you know, circle the wagons when they need to, to say, okay, we need a little help here, or this is a great idea. How do we execute it? And when you communicate that, it's, you know, it helps everyone navigate the creative sandbox. The second reason you're going to have to call in the big trucks is when you need to escalate something. And this always is a challenge. When you're you know, producer, a product manager, creative services professional, you really wanna have everything in control. And you don't wanna be the one shouting out that we missed a date and this is gonna be, you know, this is a challenge. So escalate early, escalate early. 
look at the time, see where you are, understand where creative is and call out early like, hey, we might have a little risk here. What can we do? How can we turn that you know, truck around and get it into the right path? So really trying to circle those wagons before you really get stuck in the mud. And the third reason you're gonna, you're gonna call in the big trucks is to celebrate. And so here's something that I've instilled with my team is that on every start meeting, so our hot, our you know, hot list meeting or our hot list email, the first part of that is wins. You call it the wins. You call it the wins for your team. You call it the wins for the company. You call it the wins for the people you're working with. You just call them out and say, hey, we did this. This is amazing. And you celebrate those. So on hot lists and every call you get on when you're talking about process or what's coming up, start that with, hey, what are the wins for the week? And what are those hot items? So start with wins. And that just gets you all understanding that you're in this together. You're working together and you're you know, celebrating each other's wins. And that will help you also, you know, have the, have the ability to see where, you know, things are maybe falling short or where we just need to let, just enjoy this moment and take a breath and say, we did it. Even if it's a little win, if it's releasing artwork to a printer, that is a win. When it's getting, you know, a really difficult translation through the process, that's a big win. When you launch into a new market, you know, and all of a sudden it's the best that they've ever had. You call that out, you put pictures up and you escalate that not only within your team, but show your bosses what's happening. So they can share in that win too, because everybody wants to win in this game. Everybody wants to have that moment of as a team, we did this together. And that's really, you know, when you're in that creative sandbox together, you can do that. And it's an, and it's an amazing moment. So here's what I want you to do on your Monday, morning 9 a.m or 10 a.m call and i know y'all have them because we're in creative operations and this is what we do i want you to uh, do a couple things first of all as i said call out those wins but what i'd like you to do instead of just rattling off dates of like when something's due where is it at what's happening and kind of chasing that information down instead take a minute and maybe just choose one project take a minute to ask the creative team What's your vision for this? Let them share with you their vision of what they're doing for you know, visual merchandising or photography or whatever the project is so that you can understand where they are. So that's only not gonna tell you, that's not only gonna tell you where they are in the process and you can look at your timeline and be like, they're here, but you're gonna be able to really see that vision and be in that creative sandbox with them to help make it come to fruition. And just as you saw, just as I saw my son climbing up that bookshelf back there, and you know, I really didn't know what he was aiming for. You know, that's, you know, I thought he was out of control. That's similar to what's happening with your creative team. Unless you are able to see their perspective and see, you know, what their vision is, it's really hard to feel like everything is under control. And in that case, it was, he was fine. He was reaching for a toy, he was fine. Your creative team is reaching for phenomenal execution of something that they have in their mind. So allow them the breadth of space to share it, allow them the time to get it created and allow yourself the ability to collaborate that with them to make it happen. Cause that's gonna be so much less, you know, that's gonna be so much less stressful, so much more collaborative and just so much more fun. Thank you. Thanks for that, Heidi. Super awesome. I definitely was taking a bunch of notes in there for myself too. Uh, let's see. Are you ready for some questions, Heidi? We got some coming in on the Q&A. Absolutely, bring them on. Okay, cool. Let's see, we have um, a couple that are sort of related um, and I, I'll ask them in the order that I think um, <laughs> makes sense. So what are some practical steps that you took after learning that your team nicknamed you the hammer? Literally, um, first of all, I, it, 
took a big drink of water. That was a lot. <laughs> um, I, what I did was um, I really tried to um, sit down with the creative team and talk through what that was. I sat down with the photographer first to kind of apologize and say, hey, what, what happened here? And what could I have done better? And she said, just not being so, you know, pushy, not being so like, we have to hit this moment because she's like, I know what I can do. I know what my team can do and I need that time. And she's like, but you were in charge and I didn't want to step on your toes. So what I did going forward from there is really take, try to take cues from the creative team. Again, setting up a timeline so that we knew we had to get three shots done in a day or two shots or whatever it was, but giving that a little bit more breadth of space and saying, okay, you know, we, instead of saying at one o'clock, we need to be on set at, you know, roughly after lunch, we need to be on set until about three o'clock. Let's see where we're, we're at there and make sure that we've got it. And then let's check in. So instead of not nudging, nudging, nudging and being a hammer, you know, a woodpecker, or whatever you want to talk, you know, name it. I really tried to listen to the creative team and take their cues of where they were. And what I found is they actually, you know, got things done a lot quicker than I thought. You know, once we did the next photo shoot and we tried that, the, you know, I, I said, okay, after lunch, we're gonna do, you know, two more shots. We got the first shot done like this because they felt the ease of space. They felt the ease of being able to work without someone on their shoulder all the time. And what it ended up being was we were able to get that shot done. We got another shot done. And in the end, we ended up getting more shots done that day than I had originally planned because the photographer, all of the creative team felt that they had the ability to be flexible in their inspiration. That's great. So the sort of follow on that's a little bit related to that is, is around, um, you talked about extending your sandbox sort of outside your purview. How do you approach that without stepping on partner's toes and without bulldozing? So how do you, how do you sort of well, it's a fine that. line, right? It, it is a fine line, but, you know, I've been so lucky to work with brands that are, um, you know, really creative driven, you know, Matt Cosmetics is very creative driven and, you know, our, our um, head of creative kind of like, you know, ruled the roost there and at, you know, Drunk Elephants, very similar. We're very creative driven. So, you know, what I'm allowed to do there is might be a little bit different than other brands and that the creative vision kind of leads what's happening. And so it's up to me to really figure out how to do it. And there are times when I'm like, it's not going to happen, guys. And how, how can we pull it back? But the first step I usually take is like, okay, creative director wants this to happen. The vision marketing team is really on board with this. Let's talk to the marketing team and say, hey, we know this is not what you were expecting, but we're early enough in the process to, to align and say, okay, here we go. And that's something I also do. We have alignment meetings. And again, not like nudging or you know chasing, but we have alignment meetings so that there's an internal creative alignment meeting. So we get that visualization of, okay, this is what they're thinking. And then the brain can start moving. And then you can bring in those partners and be like, okay, we know, you know we got a long time so we have to get in production, but before we get there, let's talk about it. What can we do? And if marketing is aligned, if creative is aligned, then you, you, again, you escalate it further, right? You see where you can go. And in the meantime, you're looking for solutions. So we, we didn't have partners in, you know, those production partners in those locations, but, you know, I use as many resources as I could. I reached out to former colleagues, like, who do you know in this market? Who do you know in this business who can who can I talk to, to have those conversations starting to really start to see is this even possible and is it not? And if you're able to find, you know, a way to do it and it, it sort of hits roughly the parameters, you're usually going to be able to, you know, get it through the marketing team, get it through the finance team, because they're going to see that vision and know that actually this is going to escalate our brand to here where we were kind of here. Yeah, great. That sounds like um, you're lucky enough to work in a very creatively driven business. Um, there are some questions ab about what what happens to the rest of us who may not work, you may, may not have the luxury of that. What what advice do you have um, for folks when when the vision that your creatives have isn't the same one that's shared with your client or your marketer? 
Well, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I have been in brands that are not creative driven and it is a little bit harder, but again, it, it, it's about bringing everyone into that creative sandbox and explaining the vision. Um, I know it works a little bit differently with agencies, but sometimes you're able to, you know, flip the switch on a marketer's uh, mind of like, oh, I get it. And it is really about sharing the vision early, getting ahead of it so that you're not putting people into, you know, the nth degree of like, we have to make a decision today and we have to go or not. Really bringing the teams together, again, circling the wagons, bringing marketing in, if you bring in finance, bring in the teams that are key to the decision-making and explain the vision. And hey, at the end of the day, if they all say no, then you go back to like, you know, a, a simple glorifier or a light box or, you know, a, a print ad when you wanted to do a video. Like, you go back to that. But if you're pushing the boundaries and you keep pushing, every so often, if you keep pushing the envelope, it's gonna open. Great, cool. Um, let's see, we have a, a question about, uh, we have several questions coming in uh, about 777. And, and, and seven, an seven, example seven. Of, yeah, and <laughs> examples of, of how that works in practice. Yeah. So, um, so again, I, I ha had a great producer who was on my team who, who said, okay, when I get a project, I think in these three terms. And again, it doesn't allow, it doesn't, you know, uh, work for every program, but it gives you an idea of the priorities. So if you get something in a quick, you know, let's say it's a social post, um, or it's a, um, you know, recropping of something or a small copy edit, and then you can get that out the door. So you kind of deal with the seven, seven, you know, seven second or seven minute items quickly, get them done, get them out the door. Usually not even doing a timeline that you're just getting it in as a, you know, producer, giving it to creative saying you got, you know, I need this in 15 minutes, but really, you know, it's a seven minute project. So again, you're going to build your timelines that get to have that buffer, but in your head, you're like, I know that they can do this in this amount of time. And that just sets your head against what the, what you want to um, set in your timelines. When you get like the, the seven, you know, day one, these are like education programs where a lot of the, the content already exists. You're leveraging other things, but kind of looking at them in a different way. They don't need seven weeks. They need roughly seven days. Typically they need about three, but give creative seven days to get those done and say, okay, I want, you know, I need this by, you know, this day, let's check in at day three and they'll let you know where they are. But if you give us seven days on something that ideally should maybe take three, but give them seven days, then that is, you know, an easy way to give them breadth of space. For the seven week projects, sometimes they don't take that long, but what's great about them is you can get them to start thinking big picture. You can do your check-ins. Let's say you create a seven week just creative section of your timeline, you know, give them two weeks to think about it and do it an alignment meeting. Do an alignment meeting, check in, circle the wagon, say, okay, where are we with your vision? Where, what's your vision? Let me know. So I can start thinking like, okay, he really wants to do a huge project. And I was thinking this is gonna be like, you know, a level two campaign. So also aligning there to say, hey, actually, we're not going to spend that much money on this program. So let's, let's bring it down or great, continue along. So you have seven weeks and in that seven weeks, you're going to build in two, probably two to three check-ins, you know, one at two weeks, one at, you know, five weeks, and then one you know, near, closer to the end. Yeah, good. I think that also uh, answered one of the other questions about um, what, what, what is sort of the cadence of, of meetings and check-ins that you have um, considering that you, you know, you probably have a, a, a large list of projects in the hopper at any given time. A, a large list of projects in the hopper. So we, so I do both marketing operations and creative operations. So I do manage sort of the overall brand timeline from like packaging inspiration to, you know, launch campaign. So the whole thing. And I have a couple different check-ins, but what is important is that we have a Monday hot list and then we have a follow-up meeting sometime in the week. So for, uh, you know, the packaging and sort of the overall campaign uh, umbrella, I have a hot list that goes out Monday morning so people can look at it, kind of see what they need to do and address that by the time we have a sort of meeting on Tuesdays. For the creative team, we have um, 
our hot list and we have our check-in on Monday mornings. And again, we don't always send out a visual hot list. Sometimes we don't need it, but it's, I think it's really helpful to do it so that your team can visually see. Cause some pe people hear things, but they're much more visual learners. So if you yeah. send out a hot list on you know Mondays, give the top five, top five things are the hot things. Cause you can't have more than top hot, five hot things. Otherwise everything's hot and it's a mess. So top five things that are hot, again, start with your wins, top five things that are hot. And then you have your creative touch base on that Monday morning. Cool. So you go through that top five hot list, start with wins to go through that top five hot list. And then that's the cadence. And then we used to have before COVID, we used to have a Friday check-in that was really like Friday check-in, what are your wins? We've moved that now to just an email that goes out with the wins, which so, so that we're not, you know, bombarding the creative team on a Friday to say, where is this? Instead, we're like, hey guys, this is what we got this week. This, these are the wins this week. And that'll also like trigger people to be like, well, I wasn't on the win list. Um, so they'll look at say like how they can get on the win list next week. But you know, what I find is that meetings are great and important and they're really great for sharing that vision of what's happening with creative so you can see it. But if you bombard people with too many meetings, if you bombard people with emails every incess every you know minute incessantly, 24 hours later after you follow up with something, it just gets annoying and people tune out. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, awesome. I really appreciate you sharing all this wisdom with us today. I know I'm gonna be doing some 777 and some sandboxing with my team for sure. So thanks a ton, Heidi. 